we're about to unlock a bit of a treasure chest. Inside it sit many thousands of beautiful and fascinating objects, each with a story to tell. And it also reveals some secrets about a show that's become a bit of a national institution. Welcome to Priceless Antiques Roadshow. I've watched the Antiques Roadshow as long as I can remember. I've just finished my first season and I can tell you it's been a bit of an eye-opener. I've marvelled at the encyclopedic knowledge of the experts and the sheer eclectic variety of objects brought in by the public. With 31 years of history under our belts, we thought it would be a good idea to take you deep inside the Roadshow. Over the next three weeks, the team will share previously untold stories as they come face to face with classic finds from the past. Truly priceless moments. Have you ever wondered what were the most expensive items ever seen on the show? How did a mild-mannered art expert manage to outrage the women of Shropshire? The whole reason that you've come to this WI is uh, because of the um, remark you made. Seems that today is the appointed hour of my penance. Roadshow veteran Henry Sandon takes us back to his on-screen debut when the Antiques Roadshow was a toddler in the world of television. We all love those jaw-dropping valuations when an expert has floored us with a five-figure bombshell. And there have been plenty of them over the years. But from 500 hours of programmes, which were the real corkers? Here are five finds which shocked viewers with staggering valuations. Who could forget the time when David Batty valued a piece that Nora Ambrose brought to the Antiques Roadshow? What, what do you think this is? As well, an object? Oh, it's a teapot, definitely. Well, Nora, she brought in she a, a large teapot. I think it might well have been a punch pot, actually. Wheeled and wear mid-18th century. Oh. Why, do you, why are you so sure it's a teapot? Well, my mother-in-law told me when she was a little girl that they used to use it as a teapot. I'd been chatting to Nora and she was wonderful. She was, uh, I suppose she was then in her 70s and chatty and spontaneous. Well, when my mother-in-law gave it to me, she said to me, look after it now, cos she said it's over 100 years old, she said. It was very old when I was a little girl. It's more than true. This is actually a very ancient pot indeed. Oh! It was the first time that I think anybody had ever teased a client over the pricing. You think it might be worth several hundred pounds? I don't know, I don't think so. You wouldn't have thought so? <laughs> no. No. So, you mean, if I told you it was worth six or eight hundred pounds, you'd be really shocked, would you? Oh, I would. Right. What would you say if I said it was worth Two thousand pounds. <laughs> oh, you're kidding, aren't you? Well, I am kidding, actually. <laughs> oh, it's actually worth about five to six thousand pounds. <gasps> <laughs> it was just perfect, and she said, "Of course, I'd never sell it." <gasps> Are you all right? <laughs> Two weeks later, I went up to the department where I was working in the auction house, and there was a teapot. She wanted to sell it. Oh, gosh, isn't that marvelous? <laughs> 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 Well, what a wonderful way to start our new series of The Antiques Roadshow. We it was a life-changing event for her because with that money, she was able to buy her council house in Liverpool in which she lived paying rent for more than 30 years. So suddenly she had something that she could hand on to her family. Well, the first item we saw of really enormous value I remember was in Barnstable in 1986. It's been in the family for quite a while. My grandfather gave it to my mother in 1930. And um, basically, it's been up in the loft most of the time. It was very strange the way it, uh, it turned up. The couple who owned it didn't know the first thing about it and thought it was valueless. And they weren't even going to bother to come to the show. But the dog needed a walk, and the dog's favorite walk was in the park right by our front door. So as they reached for the dog's lead, 
when leaving home, they said, why don't we take that picture? We don't know anything about it, just on the off chance, we'll take the picture. So they took the picture off the wall and brought it in with Doggy. And uh, the expert that day was Peter Nahum. Now, <coughs> it is an extraordinary painting. I don't know who this painting is by. I know it's a wonderful painting. I would hope that some indications, I mean, it would be too much to hope, really, that this was a lost painting by Richard Dyer. It was well known that Richard Dad had painted this picture, but it had been lost for about a hundred years, and suddenly, out of the blue, it turns up completely unexpectedly in Barnstable. It was breathtaking. Obviously, I've only had a, a few minutes yes. to look at this, um, and it needs some investigation. So what I would like to ask you to do is if we may take it to London on your behalf and investigate it further. Oh, yes, certainly. Uh, we'd be interested as well, you think. So with the owner's permission, we took the picture back to London, took it to the expert, and we said, look, is this the long-lost Richard Dad? And she said, yes, it certainly is. So then we had to go back to the couple in Barnstable, went to their bungalow with a film crew, and that's when Peter gave them the uh, good news and the valuation. It is an international treasure where a lost picture, and I feel that it could possibly um, make somewhat over £100,000. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he had just retired from his job. He was a driver for the Royal Air Force. And so £100,000 for them would have been very useful, and they decided to sell it. And the buyer, appropriately, was the British Museum. So that painting set, set the bar. It was the highest valuation we had ever had to that point. But the record didn't last very long, because in Crawley, just a few years later, we found uh, something of even greater value. Now, Crawley. Do you know, I'm asked about Crawley probably more than anything else I've ever done on That'd the road show. Like it, it was a most extraordinary day. This chap arrived and produced the stag's head out of his bag. Now, my heart leapt at that moment. The stag's head stirrup cup, a wonderful object. Absolute stunning. Gilded inside, and of course, these are very collectible. Actually, one of the production teams said it was at that moment I just lit up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> I would suggest, do you think, in terms of about £10,000? Not sure quite what to say. I mean, these are little things, but they seem to be worth... Um... You've got more. What else have you got in there? Um, I'm a bit flabbergasted by that. Oh, another box. Now, this one. Oh, gosh. I think this could be an early wine taster. 1607 in this case, so that's King James I. Now, that is exceptionally odd, rare. Mm. It was kind of hard to take in, really, at the time, to, to think that we had a little James I wine tasting cup that was. You know, it, it was the fact that it, I think it was the fact that it was that old. That to me, that, that rocked for my boat. I would say one should be thinking in terms of what at least twelve to fifteen thousand pounds. In fact, we never saw all of the silver. We did a rough, a sort of guesstimate of what the total value was, which we thought was probably approaching a quarter of a million pounds. But it is an extraordinary thing because I, one could actually say that you changed somebody's life. I mean, that family had been struggling. And suddenly, by selling a few of the items in that collection, which they, they subsequently did, uh, their lives literally changed. Simply because the son that morning had brought those pieces in to the road gym. It took another 10 years to eclipse that find. But in Dumfries, books expert Clive Farrahan knew he was about to make roadshow history. It's so detailed, a mouse reading a newspaper on a stool, and I noticed it signed HBP, Helen Beatrix Potter, yes. and 1890. Well, 18... The collection of Beatrix Potter had the most wonderful provenance. They came through Beatrix Potter's brother, who farmed in the borders. And, and there they were, some finished, some unfinished. I love this one, actually. Uh, I don't know if you've got a favourite among them, but I think this is my favourite. Yes. Squintina Tabby, licensed dealer in tea. And there she is, 
looking very, very cross, squinting at these two other cats who are obviously children, or kittens rather, looking in through the window. I think that is absolutely fantastic. I would have thought that would have been worth, well, £12,000 probably, or more. I can hardly believe this. It just goes on. All exquisite and done long before uh, Beatrix Potter had any fame. Last but not least are the ones that you've had framed. Mm -hmm. And these are absolutely stunning. I would say £50,000 for those each. Oh. So you've got 23. You've got the best part of a quarter of a million pounds worth of goods. Oh which I thought was an incredible amount of money. And the owner was not particularly plussed by, by it. One, one hopes when one says a large sum of money that somebody will sort of uh, jump out of their chair and uh, you know, say wild things or whatever, have a wonderful reaction. But he was very tame. I'm so Absolutely delighted amazing. and thank you for bringing them in. But the Roadshow record books were rewritten in 2008. Art specialist Philip Mould broke the news. This is the bronze maquette for the Angel of the North, the preparatory work that Gormley the sculptor, Anthony Gormley, used to persuade you on the council to commission this great object. And how do you value something like this? Well, it's easier to value than a lot of things of this stature, of this iconic resonance because another version did sell very recently. Admittedly, it was taller, and it wasn't of bronze, and that made about two million pounds, or rather a little bit over that. Yeah. So I think on the basis that this is half the size, I would comfortably value it at a million pounds. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. I was there when Philip Mould made the first ever million pound valuation, and it caused quite a bit of a stir. Some people thought the item didn't belong on the Antiques Roadshow, including some of our experts. More on that debate later in the series. For me, it was great to be present for a real roadshow first. And Philip Mould prepared carefully to deliver that valuation in front of eight million viewers. And that's not something that always comes naturally. It can take years for experts to polish their bedside manner, to deliver a relaxed chat when there's lots of cameras and people watching. Well, they all had to start somewhere. In this series, we're asking some of our smoothest operators to relive their very first moment in front of the cameras. And we're starting with the much-loved ceramics expert, Henry, of course. This is a very, very charming uh, porcelain mug. It's the earliest piece of porcelain we've had brought in today so far. But where, where did you acquire it? I joined the programme in Series 2. Um, I'd seen some of the earlier ones and uh, loved the programme very much, and it was delightful for me when, uh, when, when I was asked to do Series 2. A little cider mug, uh, a little quarter pint uh, cider mug. They drank little drinks of cider at those days. Uh, rather damaged, uh, which would, uh, of course, uh, lessen its value very, very considerably. But, uh, the first recording was, was quite interesting. I, I mean, it was the first time one... Was, had the pleasure of meeting actual people and talking about their things, which is rather well, nice. And this, this fellow brought in a, a carefully porcelain mug. Did you know what it was when you acquired it? Um, I just got interested in it. I just thought it was very nice, you know. As I say, I went for a clock. And ended, up with a, a clock. ended up with a cup. <laughs> well, I think I would prefer a, a mug like that myself to a clock, but, but that's being a, a porcelain man. Yeah. One uh, tends to be attracted to pieces of this nature. It's very nice. Very, very, very nice. pretty. And it was nice and simple and easy, and uh, I, I enjoyed it very much. Can, can one ask how much you paid for it at the same? £30. £30. Pound. Well, I suppose I've, I'm kind to people. I, I, I can winkle out of them little facts that they may not want to give, certainly about how much they paid for it, which is they sometimes don't like to do, but it's nice to know how much they paid, and then you can judge whether they're going to be shocked or, or surprised uh, at what you tell them the value is, which is always rather nice. Well, if it had been a perfect mug, it would have been in the region of, I suppose, now 100 to £150. Pounds. But uh, it is cracked under the base, which does uh, lessen the value of any piece of porcelain. But congratulations on getting it. And I hope it starts you off on a collection of porcelain instead of blocks. 
I hope so too. It was a nice, comfortable, happy, and nice little programme that no one envisaged would go on forever, almost like the archers. I mean, it's, it's quite incredible. Here it is, still, after all these years, still surviving. We are shocked. Henry Sandon, modest to the last. Not surprisingly, Henry effortlessly charms all the people he meets on roadshow days. A queue even formed to kiss him once. Pictures expert Rupert Moss, on the other hand, had quite the opposite effect on the women of Shropshire recently. Now, I like to think I know a news story when I see it, but I didn't see this one coming. It all started innocently enough at my first show at Bolton Abbey. It's signed Talmadge. 1921. Algernon <laughs> Mayon. Talmadge. Right, yeah. right. And, uh, and he was rather an interesting artist, I think. And Rupert was examining a painting and paid particular attention to a part of the subject's anatomy. Well, the media frenzy started the very next day. Well, there's an uproar in Shropshire tonight. A TV art critics upset women there for suggesting they have, wait for it, fat ankles. Rupert Mars made the comments during an episode of the much-loved Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. But uh, she's got um, slightly worryingly thick ankles, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just can't help but notice them. It's what, right. what my mother used to call Shropshire ankles. Oh, right. Well, it seems that today is the appointed hour of my penance. Well, I was asked to give a comment on the Shropshire ankle, which is now being known as the Shropshire ankle debate. Um, in my position as the Shropshire Federation Secretary of the Women's Institute. And um, in my remarks, I just happened to mention that perhaps he would like to come to Shropshire and uh, make amends for the wickedness he had done in um, affronting our ankles. It seemed to me that, uh, that the lady in the hammock was suffering a little bit from um, uh, what the Americans call a cankle, where the calf merges seamlessly into the ankle without any sort of visible narrowing. And, uh, and I thought I'd heard the phrase somewhere, Shropshire ankle, would describe this condition properly. Um, but I reckoned without uh, <laughs> a certain sort of amount of public backlash. According to Mr. Mars, women of the county have developed thick-set ankles because the hilly terrain requires them to stomp around in sturdy footwear. So I'm on my way up to Shropshire, to uh, atone for my sins, for the, 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 the grievous insult that I've given to the, the, the women of Shropshire when it, concerning their ankles. I'm going up to give a talk on art, and, uh, and hopefully they'll be all fast asleep by the end of it and won't lynch me. Shropshire ankles attached to Shropshire ladies. Ooh. And ladies, would you please welcome Rupert Mars? Good evening, ladies. Good evening. Uh, I, I feel already so much happier. I can't tell you what it's been like upstairs, you know, in this deadly silence, on my own, just waiting. I'm worried that you were going to do to me what you did to Tony Blair. You know? <laughs> uh, so we'll begin, if that's OK. This picture is Flaming June by Frederick Lord Leighton. Does anyone recognise it? Yes. It's, it's a very famous picture, isn't it? It has become so. Ahead of his lecture on the female form, Rupert made a research trip to the Tate to build a case for the defence. The sitter of this, this, this painting used to be thought to be a very beautiful girl called Dorothy Dean. Uh, in fact, we now think it's uh, another girl called Mary Lloyd. I doubt she had a thigh quite that long, but uh, my word, she was a stunner. And um, she was quite, uh, well, if I may say, quite well built as well. Great artists painting the human body often make exaggerations. Uh, Michelangelo's David, well, he's got the biggest feet you've ever seen in your life. I mean, they're really absurdly large. There's a reason for it. He stands better for having big feet. If he didn't have big feet, he'd fall over. 
And there's a reason for this girl being slightly disproportionate. It wouldn't work if her thigh was any shorter. That needs to spread across the composition to, to make the two halves of it, like a, a yin and yang shape, work. I, I, I do sometimes get into a little bit of trouble about commenting on, on the, the physical attributes of, uh, of, of, of figures in paintings, particularly women. Well, I'm analysing them. I'm trying to understand them better. Uh, it was bought by my father in 1962 for £1,000. He put it on the wall of the gallery for £2,000. And, uh, and I want you to try and guess how much it's worth. Um, have a go, have a wild go, someone. £100,000. Any advance on £100,000? <laughs> 200000 More, more, more. Come on, more. <laughs> no? Three quarters of a million. I've heard a million in the front. Straight. <laughs> Sorry, you're all beaten. No, it's, it's, it's worth at least £10 million. Oh, no. yeah. Yeah. It, it's valued at that by Christie's at the moment, and it's insured for that. Yeah. It's astonishing, isn't it? Yes. Anyway, uh, do you think we should have kept it? <laughs> so, has Rupert managed to redeem anyway, himself? Um, questions? Anyone? The whole reason that you've come to this marvellous new Frankwell Little Borough WI is uh, because of the um, remark you made about the ankles. Oh, yes. Now, having been here for some while, uh, what are your feelings on the ankles in Shropshire? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've come at winter time when most ankles are well hidden. Um, <laughs> So I have not had the opportunities I'd hoped for, but upstairs I was, I was given yes. a small private view of a particularly, <laughs> <laughs> particularly trim ankle, I must say. I was very impressed by it. But perhaps whilst you're having a cup of tea, you might examine a few more. <laughs> I, I would be absolutely delighted. <laughs> Thank you, Rupert. Well, I've had a, actually what turned out to be a completely lovely evening, and, uh, and I feel that um, they've let me off. They've actually forgiven me, and uh, so it was worth coming. I'm completely off the hook, free as a bird, and completely full also. The best lemon cake in Christendom. Thankfully, Rupert survived his trip to the Shropshire WI, but I wonder if he really was eating humble pie. Now, we all know how highly treasured family heirlooms can be. Let me tell you that whether someone is 8 or 80 years old, there are some objects that are so special you can barely prize them out of their owner's hands. Two women are on the front line when it comes to examining such precious pieces. Hilary Kay and Bunny Campione are our toy team, but sometimes their role isn't exactly child's play. <laughs> I have to say Bunny and I do get more than our fair share of furry creatures to deal with and the boys on the team always breathe a huge sigh of relief when they see that either Bunny or I are there. Can I borrow your teddy a minute? Okay. Children on the Children's Roadshow have got to be very special and I remember uh, 1991, it was wonderful, they all had their teddy bears and the teddy bears were great but the most threadbare of all of them that really was everybody thought I was going to say it's worth absolutely nothing I said this is going to be worth more than all the others because it's one of the first Steiff bears that could sit and stand I know he's a Steiff simply by looking at him he's got the right but very long arms do you see how long his arms are they're almost down to his feet I think I put something like five thousand pounds on it and there was a great sort of woo which is lovely when you've got children doing that. Did you hear that? Yeah. I tell you, on that next generation children's roadshow, not only did I have a little cutie pie child to deal with who kept jumping out of his box, but I also had this stuffed puppet to deal with. And I mean, they say you should never work with animals and children. Well, you know, I had the lot that day. Um, do, do you have a ghost toy first? Yeah. You do? Well, have, I... have you got any here? We have got some here. I tell you, there are some very good displays here with some of the old ones on. Are you interested in toy cars? Are you? Well, you ought to have a, word, a chat with, with uh, Gordon because he's a, real, he's a real enthusiast in toy cars as well. Nah, he's the wrong side for me, so I'm going to just do it this way round. Right. Does he round up? I think it was Kentville Hall in Suffolk in 2007. 
Uh, the most delightful gentleman came in with his toys that he had played with, and they were unusual toys, and they were the sort of toys that make the roadshow because they act, um, they have action and, and they move and they make a noise. And he had this tiger which was pouncing, and nobody knew it was going to pounce until we actually showed it and filmed it. And so it's sort of doing this. You wind it up, and then it's suddenly going, whoop! Oh. <laughs> and everybody, Wah! So that's, that's what it's all about. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then the skating bear that he also had, which I have never seen a skating bear smoking at the same time. And he's got a muzzle on as well. God knows how he could smoke and, and have a muzzle on. But there again, it was very unusual. And I put £2,000 on it. But I don't think they were interested in the money because they were interested in the actual pieces. There, he's opening his mouth Wonderful. now. Perhaps the cutest of finds came Bunny's way one very damp day in Scotland. In 2007, we went up to the very north, the Castle of May, lovely Queen Mother's house, and it was so exciting to go up there. But my goodness, talk about weather. I just couldn't believe the weather. So when I was filming this milk churn, that you can actually hear the noise of the rain outside. It's, it's yours. Um, yeah, I inherited it for my Greek granny. The young girl that brought in this milk churn didn't tell me anything. She just put it on the table. And I thought, I wonder what on earth this is. So I have a try? And I knew it was an automaton, but it was such an unusual one. Hello, how are you? <laughs> and the delightful way it comes out and it's been licking the cream in the milk churn. <laughs> it's absolutely enchanting. <laughs> 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 it certainly made people laugh, which they weren't laughing before. <laughs> Just goes to show, every cloud has a silver lining. And if you think you have an even cuter keepsake from your childhood, why not bring it along to our new recordings of Antiques Roadshow? We'll save a spot in the queue for you. That's it for today. I'll be back at the same time tomorrow for more Antiques Roadshow revelations when we travel to the battlefields of the Somme with Paul Atterbury and discover why his annual pilgrimage has become a family affair. And we reveal some of the most amazing bargain buys the Roadshow's ever seen. Do you have an idea of how much your mother's 50 shillings has gone up? Absolutely no. Right. Before we end tonight, it's worth pointing out that things don't always run smoothly on the roadshow. Ceramics expert David Batty came a cropper with a very innocent-looking plate, which turned his face the same shade of pink. Bye-bye. This is a very um, icing sugar pink. One would almost, dare I say it, knicker pink. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the first impression is it doesn't kind of work too well. When you start looking at it, it's absolutely fantastic, very clever. Then we've got the VR monogram, vagina... <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll have to try that one again. <laughs> That's got to be the greatest outtake of all time. <laughs> What's occurring on BBC One? It's Nessa and Uncle Bryn, Rob Bryden and Ruth Jones on The One Show. Here on BBC Two, the engineering DNA of a super rig with Richard Hammond and Doctor Who's on the run from the family of blood. Sounds nasty on BBC Three.